Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Efran Shah, or just call me Efran. I belong to the Ministry of Environment and Forestry as a senior advisor to the minister. And uh, this afternoon, there are powerful people accompanied me, and uh, we are trying to entertain an interesting subject. The keyword is ecotourism and biodiversity. So you can imagine all these people should have been dedicated their life one way or another to the nature and conservation. I will introduce them later on, but to start with, if you are at the back there, because there will be money incentive to give after the session, you are kindly required to, to move forward. Yang di belakang nggak akan dapat uh, nggak akan dapat ampau. Hi John. So I'm very happy and proud to be among friends. Pak John is uh, is an old friend of mine. Pak Director General also. So I met many of you, except perhaps Robin. For one simple reason, you are too of, too far from us. You are from Australia. But anyway, nice meeting you. And to open up our eyes, do you mind to see a little things that I prepared for you here to start the ambience of the session? Tolong Pak YouTube. Kalau tangkahan tidak ada ekoturism, mungkin hari ini hutan di sana sudah habis karena kami juga butuh kehidupan dan kami akan melakukan apapun agar kami bisa hidup karena kami juga makhluk hidup yang punya hak untuk hidup di muka bumi ini. Sebelum ekowisata, saya adalah illegal logger. Pengambilan kayu dari hutan itu tidak tabu. Semua masyarakat mengambil itu. Saya dulu ditangkap sama aparat dihukum dua tahun begitu dan di penjara saya berpikir apa sih harus ku perbuat sekembalinya aku dari penjara karena kakek saya juga bapak saya pemain illegal logging dan saya juga tapi saya berpikir kalau saya nggak berubah mungkin anak saya juga mungkin bisa seperti nasib yang saya alami seperti itu. Alasan saya dari pelaku illegal lodging menjadi pelaku pariwisata itu adalah karena melihat dampak negatif dari pelaku illegal lodging itu. Kita berubah mindset tersebut menjadi pelaku pariwisata dan kita mendapat keuntungan dengan menjaga hutan. Paket wisata gajah yang ditawarkan kepada wisatawan itu seperti memandikan gajah, berjalan bersama dengan gajah. Nah, jadi para turis dapat melihat dan mempelajari bagaimana sifat gajah di dalam hutan. All the things that we've done in Northern Sumatra have been kind of eco tourism and it's really nice to see that it's not just foreigners coming in, giving money, going away, everything's being fed back into the community so they can empower themselves so they have alternatives to being in the palm oil industry or logging or all of those things which are destroying this habitat because it's beautiful. <laughs> semua masuk tamu tangkahan melalui CTO datang tamu tangkahan kamu mau tempat di mana begitu nggak ada harus di sini nggak boleh seperti itu pemerasan itu bukan semua sama ya kan tapi semua mendapat sekarang ini bagi masyarakat yang nampak jelas sekali keuntungannya pendidikan pendidikan bahasa Inggris didanai daripada ya kita sendiri lembaga kita. Kota Seu kebanyakan bekerja di ekowisata. 
dan anggota wisata meminjam uang ke pihak Sehu untuk memodali modal usaha mereka. Karena begitu pesat pendapatan di ekowisata, mereka mengembalikan uang Sehu tepat waktu. Moto kami sekarang ini bersama Ranger, kita menjual hutan tapi tanpa memotong kayu. Kita setiap hari Jumat itu melakukan patroli di perbatasan Taman Nasional dan masyarakat. Kita kerjasama dengan Ranger-Ranger yang ada di tangkaan ini. Yang kita fokuskan kalau patroli di batas Taman Nasional dan lahan masyarakat itu ada aktivitas ilegal seperti pemasangan jerat satwa. Kawasan konservasi penting karena dia bukan warisan dari nenek moyang tetapi pinjaman dari generasi yang akan datang. Pemerintah mempunyai kewajiban untuk menjaga manfaat dan nilai kualitasnya kawasan konservasi untuk kepentingan generasi mendatang. Komitmen pemerintah dalam hal ini di Jen KSDAE adalah membangun role model sehingga keberhasilan tangkahan bisa direplikasi di tempat lain dan ada proses pembelajaran. Kemitraan sangat e, tertarik untuk mendukung takahan karena ini model hidup yang bisa kita tampilkan kepada nasional dan internasional. Masyarakat mempunyai kesadaran sendiri. Perubahan dari illegal loggers menjadi penjaga dan pelindung alam itu sangat jarang terjadi dan ternyata bisa dilakukan. Artinya adalah Sebetulnya masyarakat jika punya keinginan yang baik untuk memperoleh hasil bukan dari kayu, namun dari wisata alam bisa terjadi. Keseimbangan adalah kunci untuk mendapatkan harmonisasi. Karena harmonisasi kehidupan antara manusia dengan alam sekitarnya adalah jaminan buat keberlanjutan kehidupan di muka bumi ini. Thank you for not sleeping. This short video brings me to someone who appeared in the footage. Pak Winarno sitting next to me on the left. Wiratno. Wiratno, sorry. <laughs> I have a difficulty with your name because I call you Inung all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, Pak Inung or Pak Wiratno has been practitioner for more than 20 years in the conservation. And he is the most competent and got a heavy responsibility. So if anything wrong with the national park, any complaint about wildlife, harimau jadi-jadian, uh, badak killing, and all this kind of thing is within bearing the shoulder of Pak Inung. Nickname-nya Pak Inung karena Menteri juga manggil Pak Inung. So then I want to ask you Pak Inung, because you are the Director General of the Nature Conservation and the Ministry, What's so great about this Tangkahan? I've never been there. If you go to my hometown in Medan and then take three hours right from Medan, then in Kabupaten Langkat, you will see this place. So there must be something and there's a reason to record here some interesting aspect and elements of these features. And uh, I'd like to ask Pak Wiratno to have each of these panel, panelists will have eight minutes maximum. I told them if it is more than 10 minutes, I will call Satpam to remove them from the, from the stage. So then Pak Wiratno, of course, uh, I have to think twice to remove you, but uh, please take eight minutes to tell us uh, thing about what is interesting in Tangkahan. And in particular, my uh, special questions to you, how to design or to promote capacity to have something like this or even more than this? Is there any special recipe for that? Pak Inung known, 
he is a very rare civil servant who writes. I should dare to say who can write. He writes many books. And the latest one that I read is Tersesat di Jalan Yang Benar. So it's a very interesting book. I don't know how to translate that in English. But uh, uh, he likes to write in a storytelling style. So I, usually you are very, very apa? Uh, kind to share many books. Pa. So if you have books, please share. Uh, already shared. Already shared. <laughs> so you, you go ahead. You go ahead. You have your eight minutes. Please, thank you. Thank Can we you. give applause to Pak Inung? Pa Inung. Thank you. I, I, I would like to stand up because the gesture in communication is very important. I use Blanco to respect to Jakarta. Tepuk tangan untuk Jakarta. Tangkan is uh, it's not easy. Not like what you see, what you saw in the five minute YouTube. You can you can see on the YouTube. Yeah. It started in 20, 2000, Pak. 2000. It's, it's been 17 years right now. Yeah. And uh, I think I, I've been there for three years as a park manager in 2005 to 2007. So, bisa ditunjukkan slide-nya. I think there, this is the, the five principle. It's very important principle for those who want to work in nature conservation. First is uh, the principle of pioneering. In Bahasa Indonesia ini 5 K ini. Yeah. Pioneering, menjadi pionir, pelopor. is very important. Uh, second is about, ini Bahasa Indonesia nya kepeduli, kepedulian. Kepeloporan, kepedulian. We have to, to think about the poor, to think about the people who are struggling for their life uh, near the, the protected area system in Indonesia. There are more than 6,000 villages located nearby or even in the protected areas across this country. It's very important. Thinking about them, peduli kepada mereka. This is all the spirit, yeah. Working in conservation is not, I believe conservation is not a job. It is the way of life. Setuju apa enggak ya? Enggak kayaknya, enggak ada yang setuju. <laughs> the principle of caring. If you don't care about the poor, how can you help them? Sit together and listen. And we need consistency, Pak. We need persistency. Kita harus terus saja dengan masyarakat itu. Ya, yang terakhir is about leadership. Kepemimpinan. We have, we, I, I, I think we need strong leadership. Not only a good park manager. And the the books, uh, it is it is, uh, it is a, a new the new one. We call it a new way, cara baru, sepuluh cara baru, ten principle of if you believe if you want to work or manage conservation area. This also another. I believe this is another story. Put local community as a subject of any intervention. Not only object, masyarakat sering diobyekkan on the name of development, no way, not anymore. We put them as subject, meaning that we have to sit together with them and start from the very beginning. Whatever you project you have, you are coming from university, coming from donor country, you have to sit together with local people and talk about how to solve their problem or develop their potency. Ini udah tak bagikan belum ya? Udah ya? Everybody have this book? Sorry, not in English yet. 
Thank you, Pak. Saya kira itu, Pak, pembukaannya, Pak. I think it's quite uh, provoking propaganda about uh, shifting, shifting towards uh, more friendly approach uh, for the pro uh, ecotourism promotion, in particular taking national park and protected area as the basis. So I hope you are ready later on to question Pak Inung about the challenge you see in the area that you know of and uh, perhaps it's not a straightforward recipe. What we saw is a successful story. Must be many sad stories around. So I hope uh, the panel is ready also to share with us some of the Unsuccess, unsuccessful story, not for repetition, but not to repeat it, but for sharing to avoid such. So my second speaker came from very far away neighboring country. It's a close neighbor, but it's a fair, quite far from with the distance. And uh, she's also a practitioner. And she will zoom a little bit more about that capacity needed and then perhaps offer us some guidance based on her own experience. And uh, she is the manager of one very large operator, Interpit, yeah? In, yeah. <laughs> but it carries at least 250,000 people a year. And it seems that Robin is quite specialized in taking people to India. So in case you want to see, to go to India, so huh, then uh, please contact Robin. Robin, please, eight minutes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, I thought I'd just very briefly tell you a little bit about the Intrepid Group because a lot of people don't know about us, even though we are actually the largest adventure travel company in the world. So uh, we're a very entrepreneurial company, um, privately owned and based, our head office is in Melbourne. But in actual fact, we have 26 companies around the world both destination management companies and also sales companies. I guess what makes us different and what's been the secret to our success is that we really want to make sure that our travelers learn, have the opportunity to give back and to share with local people. We also invest in local communities we visit, employing local people in our offices worldwide, employing local leaders, in trying to provide sustainable livelihoods to the, uh, to the communities that we visit. So it's really important to us that there isn't a lot of leakage. A lot of the money in terms of our supply chain stays in the country that we're traveling in. When our founders started Intrepid, if we could have the next slide, um, we wanted to, they wanted to start a business that not only benefits travelers, but also benefits the places and people they visit. It's more than just responsible tourism. Intrepid is committed to creating shared value for shared stakeholders throughout, through our sustainable experience rich travel. So that's a little bit about Intrepid. Um, and if you want to find out more, there's some really great videos that we've just made called Be Intrepid that really talks about how important it is for us in the world more than ever to be sharing together um, around, I guess what we call Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is about peace and understanding each other. Ecotourism was a, a phrase, I guess, that's been coined since really late, 80s, early 90s, and at a national level, probably one of the most successful countries in the world who have really used ecotourism to drive their economy has been Costa Rica. Very early on, committing to 24% of their total land mass to national parks and the like, 
Ecotourism has really driven the economy. Costa Rica has made it a stated goal to be carbon neutral by 2021. It's a pretty amazing commitment. The journey hasn't, for Costa Rica, been perfect. There's been potentially, because of, as, as a developing country, the need to have external investment from private investors. There is some leakage of funds outside of the business. So local people haven't entirely benefited in some cases. In addition, in the early days, potentially without the stringency of, of regulations and codes of conduct, some of the development was perhaps not as sustainable as it might be. Nevertheless, I think Costa Rica provides a great example of what can be achieved when a country invests in ecotourism. The theme of this summit is about protecting forests and people. And I believe, and I think our business is proof to that, to really build an infrastructure for ecotourism, the most important thing that you need to do is to invest in communities and people. It's through people that unique assets of a country will be revealed. It doesn't matter what style of accommodation people stay in. From a traveler's perspective, it's the community that will bring the environment to life. It's their stories, their interaction with travelers, and most importantly, their culture that creates the lasting memories. In many ways, South America has probably provided some of the best examples at a community level of development in ecotourism. In particular, I just want to highlight probably one of the best practice examples is in an area called the Mamero Sustainable Development Reserve. This is in the Brazilian Amazon. It's an area of 1.2 million hectares, and it was created in 1990 as a unique ecosystem of flooded forests. In the development of a lodge, the Uakari Lodge, the key here was that the connection between the local communities of the forest and the Mamakari Sustainable Development Institute. There was outstanding engagement with the local communities. They were investment in employment in all aspects of the lodge. The ownership of the lodge was co-managed and by 2020 will be transferred entirely to the local people. Previously to the development, there was a lot of illegal fishing, hunting and deforestation with threats to the environment. Not only were local people engaged in the lodge, but they were employed as research assistants, and work managing other projects like sustainable fishing and sustainable forestry. More importantly, not only was a percentage of income given back to the communities, but a percentage of income was also used for surveillance within the forest. There are many such examples around the world of what we at Intrepid like to call community-based tourism. Community-based tourism is very trendy at the moment, um, but really it's something that's part of Intrepid's DNA. We started staying in communities as early as 1990 in hill tribe villages in Thailand, coastal communities in Ma Malaysia, and now nearly all of our itineraries throughout the world would have some opportunity for our travelers to stay in communities or share meals with local people. To establish successful community-based tourism, there's multiple partners involved. It's usually important to have had an NGO partner who's worked with the community for some time. There will be investment partners potentially from the private sector and government. The role of government, both local and international and municipal, is really important to success of projects, as is in the case of uh, 
environmental uh, projects, an environmental partner. To establish successful community-based tourism, it's really important that the land ownership um, is clear from the beginning. In some cases, that requires granting from government or leasing, um, which can be covered by the private sector, but on a payback system. Most importantly, though, investment is just not about money. The most important investment is usually in capacity building around a myriad of skills. And in my view, it's that capacity building and investment which is the difference between success and failure. To ensure eco-terrorism has a positive impact for both the community and the environment, it's really important to invest time in education, planning, and training. But ecotourism is not just about accommodation. It needs to be a complete cultural, environmental, and, and experiential um, activity for guests. Jobs will be created for other community members, including cooking demonstrations, wildlife guides, food and beverage supply, transport provision, handicrafts and other cultural activities. There's a particular focus in community-based tourism on creating opportunities for women to diversify incomes and develop skills and to increase participation and decision-making at both the household and community level. In addition, ecotourism projects can't be thought of in isolation from other assets in the destination. To be really successful from an international tourism perspective, it needs to fit in the context of an itinerary. What are the other unique sales features, if you like, that a client or traveler will want to see when they visit Java, for example? So a project on its own won't be enough to attract travelers from overseas. Certainly okay for your near neighbors and, and domestic tourism, but not if you want to take it out on a global scale. It's also to think about simplicity of access. The more remote it is for travelers to get to, the more difficult it is to sell the experience. This will limit market potential, potentially because of the cost that will be needed to charge to make it accessible. Over the years, there's been many pitfalls that have resulted in considerable failure in ecotourism. Often this is because from the outset there hasn't been the right mixture of partners, expertise and planning. Most communities struggle with the basic principles of business management because they've been established without a clear business focus. Various factors will set business up for failure, such as remoteness from tourism routes, and is the destination really going to be viable? A lack of real community consultation, insufficient preparedness and capacity building, and dependence on external support and aid. It's important in the assessment and consultation phase that you really speak frankly with the community about the challenge and the accountability that the community is going to need to take to support the business in the long term. If there's a lack of expertise, then there is the chance that as soon as funding's withdrawn, if there's been a lack of consultation, that the project will collapse. To mitigate those risks, it's really important that the community is involved from the beginning, that there's informed consent, that there's benefit to the community. Generally speaking, we would ensure in any projects that we're working on that there's a community fund. So, because generally, not everyone in a community can be employed in the project. But if there's a community fund, then the whole community can be partake in the decision on how that fund is used and the whole community can benefit. As an example, we're working, have been working for two years 
um, on a project uh, in Myanmar in the central dry zone area. It includes four villages, um, and our guests stay there for two nights. Um, and each village has a, a community fund, and of the villages, three of the villages have decided to save that fund for two years, which enabled them to save enough money to match the government subsidy needed to bring electricity to those villages. So as a result of us visiting, now three of the villages this year will have electricity supplied. The other village chose because during flooding, they had problems with access to invest in better road infrastructure and also to invest in better uh, classrooms for their schools. So those kinds of mitigation uh, actions are ways in which you can make sure that you have success when trying to develop local ecotourism activities. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. I hope you are still with me. Next to me, on my right, is, I told you as an old friend of mine, John. But this is not just a simply, simply John. This one is John Colme, the director of C4, who has been kind enough to facilitate the whole, uh, the whole uh, conference, the whole summit for us. He is a director of communication and a specialist in engagement. I say not simply, simply, because I know exactly he was here during the difficult time of uh, Suharto regime, a change of transition. John was the head of Bureau of Time, Chief Bureau of Time in Hong Kong, based in Hong Kong. He got 25 experience in communication as a uh, as a correspondent and foreign uh, journalist uh, working with any means possible, broadcast, radio, whatever. So, uh, for that reason, I think it's justified if I go straight forward to him asking, what is the role of communication and your specialty when we try to promote uh, uh, ecotourism at the same time uh, conservation on biodiversity. Because these two things in many places cannot go together. So we are talking about sustainability. And then do you see any incentive if we try to launch uh, marketing uh, of this initiative? John. Thank you. Thank you, Pak. Way, way, way uh, too generous in his definition of me. Um, when someone comes to me and to talk about developing a communication strategy, I always want to step back and look at the big picture. I want to simplify it. We tend to get too complicated with these things. You get lost in the details, and it's easy to get overwhelmed by the work ahead. And there's a lot of work ahead and if you're going to develop an ecotourism program. For, let's, we're going to focus on Indonesia today. Uh, but if you look at Indonesia, the size, the diversity of the landscapes and the cultures, the travel challenges, the different stakeholders, and all the messages they're putting out, it quickly becomes overwhelming if you want to develop a communication strategy. Uh, I'll give a very quick example. At C4, nine years ago, it was a very similar situation. We had a vision, we had a good reputation, we had one of the largest archives of knowledge on tropical forest, and we had an amazing network of partners, but we had one old website, and really no communication strategy at all. Today, at that time, 75% of our work was not cited by scientists. Today, 80% is cited. 12 million of our photos have been downloaded by National Geographic and others, they're open to everyone. And we appear in the global media three or four times a day. What we did was not complicated. And I always going to go back, don't overcomplicate these things. So how do we simplify this issue? We've got to go back and look at the big picture. What are we trying to do here? Who are the stakeholders? I liked, so I went back and looked, what is the definition of ecotourism? According to the Nature Conservancy, there were many there. 
environmentally responsible travel to natural areas in order to enjoy and appreciate nature that promote conservation, have a low visitor impact, and this is important, provide for beneficially active socioeconomic involvement of local peoples. We've been talking a lot today about communities, and if I forget about communities anywhere along this kind of conversation, keep bringing me back to communities. It's critical. And what I like about this is it's holistic thinking. If, if you looked at this definition eight years ago, maybe, it would, have not, it would have been much more to go visit wildlife, what we called wildlife when I was a forester. It would have been a very simple definition, but now it's a conversion of thinking in all of development that you, to succeed in development, you have to take a holistic approach. You can't target one SDG, you have to target all of them. Our C4 strategy now for forests targets all the SDGs. So you need to think holistically. Another definition that I liked I saw today was ecotourism is about uniting conservation, communities, and sustainable travel. I like that very much because those basically for me are three audiences we need to connect. So then you've got to look at what are the assets you have? What's the competitive advantage? I like to leverage what we already have. So in Indonesia, you've got 50 national parks, nine of which are predominantly marine, but that's all right. Six world heritage sites, such as the tropical rainforest heritage of Sumatra that includes three parks. Seven national parks are part of the world network of biosphere reserves, and five are wetlands of international importance under the Ramsar Convention. And if you talk and look at TripAdvisor, you've got Bali, orangutans, and Komodo dragons. But what's that important for me in communication? Every one of those is a communication travel path. It's a path. It's a path of communication that's happening to every one of those, the organizations that called them historic sites. They're there on the web. They're around the world. We need to leverage that and scale them out as a communication. But we also have to get those audiences on the same page. And that's very important. Everybody's got to be on message. Now, in the research on communication and ecotourism, they all start off with the same thing. You're going to need a national conference. You need government buy-in, and the government has to lead on this. You need a national conference where you get all these stakeholders together. Uh, you want to bring together the government, the NGOs, the travel companies, associations, experts, media, and communities. And they need to review those assets that I just described to you up above. Some of those will be more ready than for ecotourism than others. In Indonesia, it could take two days to get to some of these. Maybe those aren't the ones you want to go. They're not the low-hanging fruit. But the, that's what will happen at that national planning conference. Then you need to develop a five-year plan. You need to identify the assets by priority. And then you need to engage those three audiences to carry out the plan. And you need a message. At some point, you're going to need a message and identity. I like to think of Malaysia here. Malaysia, truly Asia. I think everyone remembers that. It was a great campaign. It was very simple. I still remember it, still remember the pictures. Everyone has to have, we, Indonesia, if you're going to look at Indonesia, they need something like that. It's not easy, by the way. But when you see it, you'll suddenly look, that was easy. Um, so then what do you, how do you communicate and engage those three communities? There's different techniques. At the local level, you're going back to more traditional communication. You're going, to have, you're going to connect communities, NGOs, business, government, experts, park rangers, community groups, media, traditional communication, town hall meetings, local media, advertising, education, and, uh, and also you've got to bring them on the same page. In Costa Rica, I saw an example where they made a network of small businesses that were put along a hiking path so the businesses could meet the hikers as they moved along. But you need that network and you need the buy-in of the local people, they need to want to support it. And then they will communicate up because the community knows the forest. A forest everywhere in the world is defined as much by the community as by the forest or go back and forth. But the community knows the forest and they know the most beautiful places, the most beautiful vistas, the most beautiful paths. They know the uh, biodiversity there. Then you got to go back to the global, uh, national and global level you need to connect with conservation groups, NGOs, civil society. These guys are very powerful communicators. And you need donors and foundations are going to be around there. You're going to need them as well. And you've got the experts, the IUCNs, the C4, the World Banks, and they're going to help. And again, you need communities at every one of those kind of conversations. And then you need sustainable travel. That's a big group. You need to connect all these stakeholders, tour operators, government departments, 
airlines, media, eco-travel associations and bodies. You need to develop global, national, regional campaigns where all the stakeholders are selling the same message. That will be mainly digital and online these days. Publications, very few people are going to read publications at this kind of level. But again, you want communities, you might tell stories about people in the communities to reach out to the world. Um, you can include media training and visits and competitions. Photo competitions are great. You might not know it, but one of the reasons we were able to help with the, work with the ministry to get 1,300 people here this week was by a photo competition. It was the number one driver of, of web traffic to our websites. It was that photo competition that you saw last night. And then you've got to be able to measure it because you can't accomplish anything without being able to measure it. You, you need to think in terms of developing indicators and track the data on a regular basis and you need to be thinking about holistic indicators. Certifications can help here. In Latin America, the Rainforest Alliance has certifications programs. And that can be the government. It doesn't have to be an NGO. My conclusion is that ecotourism is a very small market. We have to be very realistic about that. But it's going to grow. As the forests and biodiversity and communities they embrace disappear, the value is going to increase. We don't have to wait for that. Right now, Rwanda charges $1,500. My colleague told me last night per person for permits to visit the gorillas. This is what's coming. You can see what's coming in the future if you're talking about these beautiful biospheres and beautiful sites. We, but we start off by looking at the big picture. And for me, but in practice, I like to think small. Maybe you won't make billions of dollars, though that is clearly an objective. Maybe you're not gonna reach hundreds of millions of people, although I'm pretty sure you can. At the end of the day, maybe you would have saved one of those World Heritage Sites, or maybe just a part of that World Heritage Site. And for me, that means you would have succeeded, because all of us here know that you can put a value on that little bit we saved. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We are halfway to go. I hope you delay a bit your, if you want to take a nap. Please, sir, uh, do it later. We are halfway. And, uh, I'd like to inform you, one of us, you can guess whom and which one, had a quite peculiar background. The background that perhaps is not common and is not oftenly heard. He is specialized or doing research in bioremediation and biodegradation of organic pollutants, enzyme and microbial technology, and bioresource science. What a discipline, huh? <laughs> but uh, we invited him. This is a very young, brilliant researcher, Dr. Asep. On my left, Pa Asep, please identify yourself. We are inviting him to talk about something else. How, what is the uh, ideas of elements of guidelines uh, in terms of capacity building and uh, promoting the capacity of local community. So it's an honor to have the youngest I assume, yeah, youngest speaker among us, Dr. Asep Hidayat. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Espranza, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that's right, Dr. Espranza, that I have background about research is uh, correlated with the bioremediations. It means that we collect some microbe from the tropical forest, especially from national park, and then collect the, some uh, microbe there to apply to uh, reduce some organic pollutant later. Uh, well, uh, in this session, I would like to explain uh, about related, not correlated to our study, but we try to uh, review some reference correlated to 
tourism and biodiversity loss. As we know that the Indonesia no, uh, have the high biodiversity loss, but no, uh, all, up, all of us know that the biodiversity in Indonesia become, become lost. And then it also because some human activity in there. But no, by doing Pak uh, Wiratno and others, we can still save uh, some uh, protected area. Uh, with the high potential biodiversity and also magnificent landscape in there. But another side, we also have growth of the tourism industry there. But it could be understood that the biodiversity is backbone of tourism. It means that the tourism activity enjoying of the biodiversity. But no, because some high potential biodiversity and also magnificent landscape has been protected area. This protected area will become remaining spot from research and education purposes. And the current picture show that the remaining spot area are usually fragmented and high sensitive to habitat and special species loss. Consider the loss of a prion living system, such as uh, a high animal and also plants. But the loss of microorganism, yeah, I will talk about microorganism here. But the, the loss of the microorganism related to the tourism activity is unseen. And it should be not all of us that the microorganism is very sensitive to habitat alterations. Another side we know that the research correlated to the microorganism has been less in study until now. If we lose of the microorganism in there, we also will lose so many potential bioresources because microorganism can we use as the agent of bioremediation, as uh, Francis said before, biofuel, bioenergy, biohealth, and other bio. Maybe later, if you know more about microbiology usage, it I can say in discussion session. Okay. Uh, the another ones, uh, there are relationship between tourist destination with the high potential biodiversity. The area with the high level destination coincide with this area high diversity or outstanding landscape. By merging two activities, first is uh, correlated to the biodiversity and the second one correlated to the tourism activities, we can see uh, two impacts. First is the positive impact and then second is negative impact. If we say about the positive impact, of course, it will create local uh, growth, it means an economic growth from the local and national scale, and also can generate uh, some source from the uh, biodiversity conservation itself. But another side we cannot ignore because the tourism activity has the negative impact, such as generate uh, pollution. From, for example, it's very easy, so many ways there, very, very, very uh, difficult to obtain water and others. And fragmented or, uh, habitat and ecosystem, a trigger biodiversity loss, introduction of the invasive alien species and also climate change. But now, how to minimize the negative impact of uh, 
tourism activities on the biodiversity loss. It is necessary to make a standard for all improved stakeholders, including the governments, also uh, private sector, local residents, and also other major practice. The first one, um, the government should prepare some actions or program can do like the provide, providing a proper regulations uh, from the development of the tourism. It's which that the biodiversity conservation to be main consideration in uh, many aspects. And then second ones, the government also need to enforce existing law and regulations, for example, by applying a reward and also punishment, increasing local people, as uh, Pak Wiratno say, increasing local people awareness and a changing knowledge, a changing knowledge of biodiversity conservation by education program, or of course, by education program and then interactive program. And the last one is necessary to allocate to allocating suspending on biodiversity conservation. And other ones is more important is the private sector because the private private sector is more significant. Uh, they need to assure that this activity always incorporate about biodiversity conservation. And they also need to make education they staff, they customer to have concern and contribute to biodiversity conservation. Other ones, private sector should make new innovation about biodiversity conservation such as less in the paper use, plastic use, and others. Make relationship good between uh, all practice in managing of protected area and also conservation area. Increasing local people to become aware and also um, making integrated with their framework. Other one is local people itself. They needed to spot in take action in uh, tourism and biodiversity conservation. And they also need to collaborate with visitor awareness campaigns about biodiversity conservation. And other major practice is visitor, NGO, and expert. Visitor should be learn more about awareness their destination. So finally, visitor can not only enjoy this trip, but they can help contribution and aware about their destination. The second one is NGO. NGO also can make taking action in collaborating or accelerate or practice uh, in tourism and biodiversity conservation. The last one, the expert. Expert can make improvement on making a master plan, development strategy, and also advise all practice to make sure that the tourism activity and uh, biodiversity loss can be, be minimized and sustainable in the future. Maybe this is uh, my presentation. I hope uh, can answer all questions for the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pasep. If you don't mind, I proceed so immediately after the two panelists, following panelists, we will have a, a free open answer, question and answer and dialogue and interaction with you all guys. So let me introduce somebody truly local to you because she is from Bantul. <laughs> so Mbak Muji, Sri Mujiati is the director of Fire 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 Fia Fia Company. This Fia Fia Company is a Belgi Belgian uh, initiative project for responsible tourism. 
So uh, she is a practitioner and she will share with us uh, and she is representing association of ASITA, yeah? uh, a travel agency. So uh, she will share with us uh, the inf information that they possess about promoting ecotourism. And I hope also towards the end, she will share some discount for our tickets. Come on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pak Efransa. Uh, it's a being honored to be here with all these great speakers. Well, actually, uh, uh, anyone here come from Bantul? Bantul, ah, yeah, Bantul forever, yeah? <laughs> Okay, anyone here from East Java? East Java? Okay. Banyuwangi? Specifically? Uh, Marubetiri National Park? No one's. Okay, wow. Well, uh, I told at the very beginning to Pa Ifransa that uh, actually I would, we would I would like to deliver the uh, message basically about ecotourism, but here with the great panelists and uh, speakers, they are already talk about it. So that actually I will uh, only uh, add or uh, especially the role of travel agency, especially how we do it in this uh, tourism activities. Yeah, so uh, it's. Even like for us as a travel operator, it's also a big challenge, especially how we uh, deliver our message to the visitors, but also to the uh, local communities. Meanwhile, we also need to have a good communications and also relations uh, with other private sectors and governments. Also, I can say, uh, stakeholders. Well, uh, in my notes, I would like to uh, share one of the, um, actually this one is one of the uh, incentives that we as a travel operator give to the local communities. At that time, we have, uh, well up to now, we have uh, uh, a tour actually. I will take like the small scale first, a tour to uh, Marubetiri National Park. So that at uh, most of the tours, it's uh, uh, we stay there for two nights, and also we give a chance for the uh, tourists uh, to interact with the community there. And then at that times, we also do on the spot trainings, especially how we raise awareness about the environment, especially in the national park itself. Um, we gave also uh, educational uh, trainings and we built a library. But then again, one of our weakness at that time, because um, we, uh, uh, our communications with the private sectors and also the, uh, the government itself is not there yet because of the uh, uh, remote area, so that we don't have any consistency. As Pa Viratno said at the very beginnings, you, we need the consistency. We also need the pioneer or leadership events. Yeah? But then, at that time, we miss it. So that it is kind of only memory. Yeah? But then, again, it was a good beginning as a travel operator or tour operator to give incentive in that area, especially to raise awareness about ecotourism. Yeah, and of course the biodiversity in the forest itself because uh, the national park is uh, one of the conservation area. And then, um, on the other hand, what we see it as a good investment is actually human resources. However, it should be Again, continue, which means not only the tour operator, but also uh, all the stakeholders that involved in the tourism activity should be there. And again, it should be in one 
uh, communication line with the governments. And um, this, uh, well, here I would say that uh, local communities as the direct messenger, especially because they are the ones who uh, become the direct messenger to the visitor, it means it has uh, main roles. And then after that, the travel agents, including also the guide, should have the capacity to inform the visitors, also become the communicator to the visitors. And um, here, the uh, governments um, become the pioneers, of course, because uh, uh, government is the one who has uh, uh, main relations in the international community. And then, but then also the manager, controllers, and promoters. Yeah, as uh, John said about how, how we should communicate about the ecotourism, so that in here, in this level, then the government is uh, uh, take the main roles. And then um, I think in uh, developing the ecotourism, uh, what we should um, uh, deliver to the community is also the uh, positive impact but also the negative impact. Sometimes we uh, miss this negative impact. Uh, we only say that, oh, we would like to maximize all the positive impact, but then the negative impact itself, we miss it. So that's why the, uh, to prevent all this uh, negative impact, we should give trainings, workshop, and also uh, educations. And um, I think it's also all part of the capacity buildings for the local communities. Yeah? As here, local community really has the biggest role in this ecotourism because without them, it will never work well. Well, I, I, um, I will uh, give one of the best practice actually about the uh, ecotourism in Indonesia here that it's already uh, achieved an award, especially from the government, is the uh, INVEST, it's Innovative Indigenous Flores Ecotourism for Sustainable Trades. Um, what the um, um, project do at that time is uh, the first is capacity buildings on local ecotourism guiding service. So it's more about the guiding uh, service. And then after that, the developments of a high quality ecotourism product in targets of village. And then developments of pricings and joint marketing strategies. It is very, uh, very important because as we know, sometimes what happens in the tourism activities we get trap price. <laughs> yeah, it's part of, uh, I will say, it's scam. So, of course, to uh, minimize, let's say to minimize or to overcome it, then we need to establish the or develop the pricing and uh, the marketing strategies. And then the next one is establishment of tourism organizations and its administration system in participating target village. So again, village here has the main roles. And the next one, developments of village tourism plans aimed at fostering the implementations of corporate social responsibility and nationwide, nationwide proper econo economic development program. So in this area, the villagers also, they already realize that if we want to achieve the goals of ecotourism, then working together is very important. And then uh, what I would like to say, um, especially as a travel uh, agency and also travel associations, uh, I, we would like to say ecotourism is one of recreation activities that may encourage conservation and also preserve biodiversity in the destinations. The involvement of local community has a big role on the implementations of economic itself. 
However, a good mutual relations among the governments, private sectors, and stakeholders in tourism activity needs to be built and maintained so that the goals will be achieved. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mbak Muji. Thank you very much. It brings, it brings us to our last panelists. I think you have heard about Indonesia Biodiversity Foundation. This is a pioneer and this is the first, if not the only, uh, trust fund uh, related to biodiversity conservation uh, in Indonesia. So it's worth more than 100 uh, million, 125, they are managing 125 million US dollar. So we have with us in honor to have Dr. Samedi. Uh, he's younger than me, but uh, he has been there for so many years. Uh, he has a background on biology, but uh, I uh, invited him to talk about uh, something a little bit uh, particular in relation to investment, potential investment, of course, and then the role of uh, ecotourism versus biodiversity conservation. Along the line, I do hope that he will touch upon carrying capacity because we have not uh, heard this uh, term so far. And then uh, talk about more incentive, if you wish. Dr. Samedi. Thank you very much, Pa Efrancha. Uh, the good thing being the last speaker is that we have only to underline what uh, previous speakers has said. Uh, yeah, uh, firstly, I would like to underline what uh, John has mentioned on, on the definition of the ecotourism. Uh, I would like to uh, present uh, here, uh, John mentioned the definition from TNC, but uh, we have also definition from TS that more or less the same. Uh, the, my point is that the keyword on, on the definition, that's a TS, or the International Ecotourism Society, uh, defined that ecotourism is responsible travel to natural areas that conserve the environment and improves the well-being of local people. Uh, the keywords is uh, re responsible travel, uh, conservation, uh, and local people. Uh, Robin also mentioned about the importance of local people. Uh, we agree all that local people is important. Why? Uh, because uh, we have we have to increase the or the, the to build the capacity of the local people uh, to build the readiness of the local people uh, to receive mostly foreign uh, visitors and receiving foreign visitors is not easy this is can change uh, the behavior of the local peoples. So there must be probably uh, something like social safeguard on, on this regard. So uh, developing uh, ecotourism industry uh, should uh, take into account the social uh, readiness. That's uh, the, the first thing. And as Pa Efrancha mentioned, uh, just now, that uh, the, the roles of NGOs is important in this regard. Uh, I would like to uh, mention here that uh, Kehati, as the trust fund, as the national trust fund, is working with the local NGOs, provide grants uh, to local NGOs, and the local NGOs provide uh, guidelines and assistance to local people and uh, as we were, we are aware that uh, 
local people is very close to poverty. Uh, poverty is driving people to pursue livelihoods that often destroy the very natural resources on which they rely. Uh, so ecotourism has increasingly been used as the solution. And uh, local NGOs must have, uh, must have been effectively working as the catalyst uh, between the government, local people, uh, private sectors, and uh, helping in capacity building and provide long-term guidance to the local people. That's uh, mostly, the, in, in general, the, the uh, NGOs should uh, be working on the local level. Uh, concerning the benefits and incentives, that uh, there are, uh, except that Pak Wirat not just uh, presented uh, no in Tangkahan, that's uh, only a few examples, uh, Pak, that uh, ecotourism operations generate significant local economic benefits. Uh, and also building local management capacity and business skills or actively involve local community in, in the planning. Uh, that's all things can, uh, is the opportunity, opportunity for, for us to build or, uh, or probably companies or somebody else could develop the tourism industry that uh, professionalize the management of tourism, uh, concessions in the national park and, and things like that. So, so that's the area of, of, of uh, weakness that probably can be uh, significantly uh, improved. So uh, what is this, the investment that needed and by whom? Uh, Fa failure in, in developing the tourism industry, uh, there are two things. Firstly, lack of inherent potential. That's probably, the, the area is not potential, uh, it's not, there is no potential, potential at all in, uh, for tourism development. But uh, the second one, uh, the failure, probably uh, in connection or with regard to the poor management. So, uh, this is the, the things that uh, we, we have to, to improve. Uh, we would like to uh, propose that there are five types of, of investment that, uh, that probably we, we, we could explore further. Uh, the first one that's now already developed, especially in in the national park or in the protected areas, Pak uh, Viratno, I think, is already uh, mentioned here. Uh, investment, ecotourism companies uh, that can then take the business management of tourism concession in the national park. This is a private companies in the public pro protected areas. Uh, that's the first one and that's already uh, developed now. Uh, the second one, probably investment in uh, joint venture, public-private partnership, uh, particularly between communities and private sector and, and the governments based on participatory equitable negotiation. And I think Robin mentioned the example in Brazil or, yeah, in Brazil. Yeah, that's an example of... Uh, public-private partnership that's already uh, successful in, in other countries. And probably we can, uh, the, the third one, the investment on uh, chain of ecotourism, uh, like hotels, related operations with well-designed facilities, professional management, centralized back office operations, and a common promotional strategy to create branding, brand, uh, that is synonymous with the highest tourism standards. Uh, talking about standards, that I, I agree with Pa Asep uh, just now, uh, but beyond standards, uh, probably we need to uh, 
something like certification that all operations must be certified that uh, certifi and certification schemes and, and probably labeling uh, needs also guidelines uh, that the certific certification schemes is global in concept but local in applications so small scale operations can also be facilitated in, uh, in this regard and the last one I would like to talk about is uh, the transfer uh, knowledge that uh, we have to think globally and act uh, locally that concerted efforts must be done uh, between all stakeholders the government the NGOs uh, the community and 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 all all uh, tour operators uh, must be working together. Thank you very much. Do you want to have a cup of coffee or tea? <laughs> but uh, I will ask Pa Asep later if you are allowed to go out and to take coffee and tea inside. But before doing so, I'd like to test the water with three interactions from the left, from the right, and from the middle. So three questions first to see your interest. I myself, I'm not very happy because I still want to hear more about, I mentioned just now, carrying capacity. And then something came up to my mind coming from Sumatra. If you start talking with the local community, consulting them on uh, ecotourism, oh, people in my village immediately, oh, US dollars. Oh, bule coming. So, oh, money. Uh, so, you know, the point is, you need to start dealing with expectation. Usually, it's much higher than the initiative and the idea. In particular, when John said we should uh, start with the rational or relatively small scale, not to be ambitious. But when you are consulting people, and in my kampong, being a Batakian, my, if you try to consult my uncle, I have 150 uncles. So then, uh, so many clan to consult. And uh, they are all related. Some of them are in the park, but they are all related to the people outside the park, all other families. So uh, it's interesting to see because I believe, depending on the uh, socioeconomic factor, response to the uh, consultation on opening up for investment would be different. So that is my question, but I believe it will be embodied somewhere. You must be curious. Can I go to the right wing? Oh, we are going like in the parliament in the UK now. The right? Yeah. Is that any on the right? Yeah. One. Second in the middle, lady. Yeah. Ibu, yeah, second. And then on the third, I close here. Yeah, Pak. So can we go to the first question? Uh, can we just note the, the three questions first? Please, Pak, uh, ada itunya. Pelantang. You have plantang suara over there? Yeah. Apa? Microphone. Ada, ada. ada. Oh, ya yeah, Mbak, please. Terima kasih. Selamat siang semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya langsung saja to the point. Yeah, siapa dari mana Mbak? Ya, nama saya Pipi Noviati Sadikin dari Universitas Sahid. Um, people usually see ecotourism as a tourism industry uh, because there is a process of sell and buy but in my opinion it is a development process uh, where uh, there is a there it it is need to to uh, produce or to conduct uh, training or uh, workshop to promote the capacity and therefore um, people tend to choose uh, ecotourism operator which 
professional because they see it is a business or industrial uh, sector. Uh, for example, in Lombok, Gunung Rinjani, state as uh, Taman Nasional Gunung Rinjani, state as ecotourism, but in uh, 2017, uh, it achieved until 80,000 people visits there. So uh, this is perhaps more than the carrying capacity because it is a uh, apa? conservation area and catchment area for uh, Lombok Island uh, for water uh, and as we know uh, with a limited capacity of local community because they have to compete with the uh, trekking organized professional trekking organizer or travel travel agent who professional to get the guests. So um, as we know with limited capacity of local community, people choose to the professional one and uh, who come outsider not local community so how how to solve this yeah. problem i and got second, the question okay you and have second, another question yes uh with the information technology such as social media it is not about promotion uh about uh, one one uh, location but also about uh the the planning to prepare community as fast as social media viral because people uh, take pictures everywhere and then they get uh, viral in social media and people come uh, people come and uh, the location is uh, so crowded. Overcrowded, crowded. yeah. Okay. okay. You got it. Okay. okay. Tadi mana ada dari kiri tengah? Sosialis. Uh, left. Center left. Terima kasih. Somebody. Oh, on the right center. Please. Terima kasih, thank you, Pak F. Fransa. Ya, ya, my name is Heru Komarudin from C4. Ya, yeah. uh, I would like to focus on the second theme of this panel, which is about conservation of biodiversity. It's nothing to do with the, uh, the ecotourism. But I would like to, I think, con if we talk about conservation of biodiversity, we have to go beyond conservation area and also kawasan hutan or forest land. So uh, I would like to address my question to Pak Wiratno probably, yeah. Uh, I think it is important to protect high conservation value areas in fragmented areas, Pak Wiratno, which is, which is uh, in fact outside the kawasan, uh, outside conservation areas and forest land. And based on the study conducted by the Ministry of uh, Environmental and Forestry and I think in the Ministry of Marine, it was back in 2013, I think, that uh, they found that 80% of the high conservation value areas is located outside the Kawasan Conservancy. So it is very important. And I, 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 I know that the, the Director General that you are leading, Pak Wiratno, is responsible for, and now is designing a, a concept which is called the Ecosystem Essential area yeah, but yeah. and you have uh, launched a very ambitious uh, target 2019 that you will establish like one, 105 million hectare of ecosystem areas and now I think like 23 or something yeah, but still but my, my question is uh, we, we learn about what you have done in terms of providing uh, guidelines and policies on protecting this uh, area and protecting these high value areas outside co uh, co conservation areas but we learned that this is uh, ended we ended up in, in, in I mean where that this is only voluntary because the, the regulation that you are I think is still not legally binding or something like that. and now the ministry I think is trying to develop another one which is uh, 
based on the minister regulation. I don't know. So my question is just, I think, uh, uh, the yeah. status of this regulation, whether it is, how, how do you see, this, how do you see the, the future of the regulation which is still not legally binding, no sanction for those failing to protect a conservation nation. Thank we you, got Pai the Frank. point. We got the question. Uh, lady in blue, please. Uh. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Virginia Young from Australia, um, the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society. Believe it or not, we once had quite a lot of rainforest, but it's nearly all gone. <laughs> but we, we, st we still do have some very beautiful forested areas. But one of the, the lessons for me being involved in both conservation and tourism issues in Australia has been that it's important to think about future demand and, and your future natural assets, not just the, the assets you've got now, but how are you going to not maintain their resilience, improve their resilience, um, and, and build your future natural asset base for biodiversity and ecotourism. I think it goes to the heart of one of the issues you were talking about. You were talking about carrying capacity in terms of the number of people that you can sustainably bring into natural areas. But there's a just as fundamental question about the, the carrying capacity of the natural area um, with, if it's isolated. So it's not about people, it's about isolation, um, whether it's hemmed in, if areas are hemmed in by cities and a lot of development. Should you be planning now for how to restore areas that build connections between existing protected areas, buffer and improve the resilience of those protected areas and integrating that with your tourism strategies, your, your carbon and other community development strategies um, you really do have an extraordinary landscape, just that little film that was shown at the beginning. I have never, as an Australian, contemplated visiting Indonesia. This is... I've been to Bali. Every Australian's been to Bali. Um, but, but we... Ha uh, very few actually come here and experience wild nature in Indonesia. So I'm sitting here asking myself, why is that? And I think it's partly because I associate Indonesia with the death of orangutans and the loss of forest to palm oil. And so I associate Indonesia with damage. So I think it's really important to shift that picture that, you know, Indonesia actually cares for its natural world. It has beautiful landscapes. And it has people who are proud of them. And that as a Western visitor or a developed country visitor, we can come here and, and help local communities. So, I, you know, to me, this has actually been very revealing. Um, but I, I would encourage, because um, what the lessons from Australia is if you have isolated parks that aren't connected, where you don't focus on the resilience, of the natural underpinnings, the parks fail and your natural asset fails. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. You talk about resilience and then you immediately remind me on the challenge of Great Barrier, current uh, Great Barrier Challenge. So that uh, yes. uh, is a very, very pertinent to and, that And that's issues. because we have the fourth highest deforestation rate in the world at the moment in Queensland. Queensland. In Queensland. And that's government regulation change that has not been fixed. And so it's not just climate change impacting the reef, it's land clearing, it's all of these other degrading forces taking out one of the world's great natural wonders. Thank so, you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. So I got three questions as expected, but let us be a bit generous for one more extra questions on the left. One more. Pa, siapa tadi? Yeah, you. Thank you, Mr. Efrancha. Uh, my name is Rifki. I'm from My name is Rifki. I'm from Indonesia Ecotourism Network in Dekon. 
because our site, our working site is mentioned two times in Tangkahan and also with Invest in Flores, maybe I would like to sharing and ask, quest, ask some question. My first question is the same, almost the same. With, uh, it's about the, how much is too much? Because it's about us, as the, the asset in ecotourism is we talk about the mountain, we talk about the forest, we talk about the wildlife, we talk about the coral reef. And in here, and in Indonesia, we have a lot of pressure to the asset from other activity. But now it's, it's not only from other activity, but also from tourism itself. So I would like uh, how to deal with this situation, especially when Indonesian government now set 10 national priority destination, tourism destination, and several is in national park and the target a lot of number of visitors come to that national park as like as in Komodo and Wakatobi and Pulau uh, Thousand Island National Park. Uh, the second question maybe to uh, Robin interpret. Uh, it's about the market is how you now internet is influenced so a lot to the market about social media. In here, the influence social media, then a lot of young, young visitors came to the park and mostly it's to just come, take a picture, upload, and then leave. I don't know in, in your market, but with the internet, situa internet influence so big, how, how do you manage your market that can contribute to the location in sustainable way to the to your to the location where you visit in sustainable way. Okay. Uh, uh, the other is about the capacity. Our encoding experience, the capacity is very important, and also it's not only about if because we develop in the local community to develop the tourism, but it's not also about local community, it's also about local government and park management. So, increase the capacity is very important and the biggest challenge in our experience in develop a tourism site at community level is about, about the minutes, the business, the minute, the location, the minute impact, the impact of the tourism, so about the okay. local organization. That is the okay. biggest challenge. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. So, we should applaud you because you have a very lively and uh, uh, not easy questions. Do you want all of us to respond? So, but we want to be a bit more efficient. Uh, we're going to deal with it as much as we can. And I know you cannot hide from me. Among you, there are few, if not many, resource persons. I don't know why you are hiding, not be speaker here. But I'm going to visit you a bit later. And I start mobilizing my resources here with the three of us trying to satisfy as much as we can. And then we will see. And then if you cannot, I'll take care of the rest. So, Pawinarno uh, first, because there is a question of potential conflicting voluntary guidelines and the new regulation and the, the high feeling of a high target, uh, of national target for promoting ecotourism, number of tourism, etc. Can you deal with that, Pa? Yeah. And any others? I, I, I think I, and I, uh, ecotourism in uh, Protected areas have to be managed uh, very carefully. Yeah, we cannot follow the target of the Minister of Tourism. Yeah, uh, and, uh, going to the summit, or there will be, there must be a Gunung Gede, there and Bromo, there must be a, 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 a quota for climbing the summit, for instance. It is, I think. I don't know if they are coming to the summit, is it uh, ecotourism or not? In Tangkahan, it is not only because, because of the history of conflict. 
In the 70s, they are illegal loggers. In the 80s, they are illegal loggers. In the 90s, they are still illegal loggers. And it started in 2000, there is a big change because of awareness of the, of the local champion. And at the, first, at the very beginning, they can help and work with us in Tangkahan. So Tangkahan is not only in my belief, and uh, I know because I, I work with them for three years, fully three years, that they are not only uh, selling, uh, selling the, the nature, but they, they're protecting the, the asset. That is the message from Tangkahan. And there is a layer of awareness of the local people that we, they will not go into the jungle and cutting the trees, never. Because we aware, we have to protect the nature. Not only because of the money, not because of the benefit, sharing or whatever. Because we love the nature. In Tangkan, you, you, you can Google Tangkan, ecotourism Tangkan. Managed by local, managed by Lembaga Parwisata Tangkahan. That the message, uh, uh, carrying capacity, of course, there is a big problem everywhere. So we have to discuss this into very detail. And we don't have also the standardization of the guiding and in, in Tangkana is very, and, and, and ecotourism is very diverse, but it is our concern. The ecosystem essential, yes, it is now in the process, uh, uh, the government, uh, the ministerial regulation uh, coming soon for ecosystem essential. Uh, a problem that uh, even though we have a uh, 27.1 million hectare of protected area system, many wildlife yeah, stay outside the protected area system. Like almost 80% of orang utan in central Kalimantan, not in the living, not in the protected area system. That is the problem and the habitat loss and everything. The problem, ya. Yeah? Apalagi tadi? I think I, I, I answer all this question, yeah? Guidelines and, uh, we need, we need, uh, we will have a guideline on eco, uh, ecosystem essential, but very soon, yeah. But the problem is not only the guideline, the problem is how we develop awareness at all level to work with or manage in collaboration of all those pro, uh, sensitive uh, area, uh, uh, habitat, very important habitat. So we work right now with the private sector, we work with the uh, local NGOs, like Pak Samiti said, it's not enough the national NGO, but we have to strengthen the local. It is very important. Thank you, Pak. I, I wonder whether we are allowed to get coffee, Pak. Udah ada, belum? Sorry. Yeah, okay. The committee said that we are going to continue until 9 p.m. I don't know whether we can get last uh, without coffee. But anyway, so my two other colleagues here will help me to deal with the uh, other questions. And then if there are still, then we go to the Indonesian forces, Indonesian speakers. Okay. Yes. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the questions relating to how to manage capacity. Um, I think uh, managing capacity is, will be, it already is, but it will be the biggest challenge in the tourism business in the years to come. And part of the reason for this, and we're already seeing it in many parts of the world, and particularly in Asia, is as two of the biggest countries in the world are harnessing their energy to travel, namely China and India. We are seeing massive uh, inbound tourism numbers, particularly in countries in Asia. And I think uh, the only way that it can be managed is when the hard conversations start to happen. Some countries in the world have already started to tackle these issues about overcapacity by actually limiting the number of people allowed 
to certain national parks and destinations on a daily and annual basis. So, for example, in uh, Uganda, in the um, Burundi pen impenetrable forest where the gorillas live, only four groups of eight people, 32 people a day, are allowed to trek to see the gorillas. So, it, now, you have to pay for that privilege, of course, but it is about governments trying to, not just governments, also communities and private institutions, finding that balance between protecting the resource for the long term compared to making a quick buck today. Another example in Peru, uh, one of the most famous sites in the world in Machu Picchu, um, they, there are only a certain number of permits allowed to track the Inca Trail, and they also close it for one month in the year to do maintenance. Um, so only 500 people a day are allowed on the trail, and in addition, they have also limited the number of people who can actually enter the site each day as well. So. Um, and so over a day, I think the limit is around 7,000 people, which is still a lot of people. But at least it's a government that's trying to understand that f to preserve the site, the archaeological site for the future, they can't um, carry the number of people um, that demand would actually have go through there. So I think it's similar. We talked about the importance of communities. Communities also have to decide how much tourism is going to be enough. How are they going to control and protect not only their environment, but actually also their own lives? Because over-tourism destroys culture as well. It can destroy family life. It can have a really negative effect on, on children as well. So, you know, we need to find this balance between improving livelihoods, but actually also having too much. And I think they're the hard conversations that we need to have at the outset when you're at the planning stages. Um, because sometimes greed, if you like, the desire to, to make too much revenue from tourism will destroy the very thing that tourists come to see in the first place. So I think that's the caution that we need to think about. And governance need to be brave enough to put those plans in place as well. Good. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was struck by the 80,000 visits, and I go back to measurement. If we look at this definition that we've agreed, I think, here, that it's environmentally responsible, that it has low visitor impact, and that it is beneficially active socio-economic involvement of local people, you can't measure one indicator of success. If it's true ecotourism, you have to measure four or five indicators. Is the biodiversity stable or improving? Is the community, is it more equitable? Is it more productive? Is it more beneficial? You always have to think in terms of a holistic measurement program, even the communication. Is the social media, is it ecotourism? Then it'd be beneficial. If it's destructive, then we're not doing ecotourism. So we always got to think about measuring and be measuring those all the time and agreeing on those indicators, by the way, with, at the community level. Yeah. I think we are dealing mostly with the capacity, how much is much or how much is too much, and then uh, do and don't and the role of the government. The lady in blue just now asking, I mean, touching upon the idea more detail on forecast and planning. Is there anything on that? I just want to ask one question. I want to ask one interesting question to the panel. As a journalist now, I'll step back to journalism. If you preserve a certain animal or biodiversity, but you destroy the social fabric of the community, is, have you succeeded? It, you understand? Uh, if I can get it, uh, if we preserve, a for example, Javanese leopard, uh, what is your question? If, at the expense, at the 
the expense of destroying the social community, the social fabric of the community of that uh, forest. Uh, right. It's uh, a good question. That's uh, we protect a species, but with the expense of of uh, social social uh, in social expenses. Uh, probably, pa, uh, this is on on the Directorate General of KSDA's uh, work on on how we can balance between conservation and and social. I think uh, Indonesia is working on on uh, how conservation is uh, should not undermine the social or or uh, uh, people things. That's mm, I'm not quite sure uh, how we we can be working on on, on this particular uh, part. But uh, social and conservation must be uh, done in in uh, parallel way. That's that's uh, okay. What can I get? I. No, it's an intriguing question from John. To me, if there is a question, Pa, for single horn rhino, Badak Berjula Satu, Java. So then they need larger habitat. We don't have much space in Java. No. So then either we remove the rhino to other place or we remove some of the Javanese or Sundanese. So, this is an intriguing question. So, how far we find and how, what is the best approach for trading of this? Uh, because in an extreme area, decision has to be made. Have you think about that, Java, Java Rhino? Yeah. We cannot value uh, biodiversity. There is many approach on that. For instance, for instance, uh, for instance, one orang utan. The cost of the living cost of one orang utan per month is three million rupiah per individu. Yeah, in the rehabilitation center. Now we have like uh, one thousand rehabilitated orang utan in the rehabilitation center. Because of habitat loss, because of uh, everything, yeah. So this is the cost of uh, losing the habitat. In Central Kalimantan, 2.2 million hectare of palm oil, yeah, 2.2 million hectare of palm oil, almost uh, 0.5 million hectare used to be in the habitat of orangutan. So this is this, the problem we face right now, the real problem. And uh, uh, protected areas surrounded by 6,000, more than 6,000 villages. So the only way is we have to work with the local, whatever the cost. Takes time, need strong leadership like in Tangkahan. It's been 17 years, Tangkar now, and survive. They, we got a PNBP and the upper tax revenue from Tangkahan is about 300 million rupiah. 300 juta, ya, berapa itu? Per year. Very small. But the money going around the two villages because of the ecotourism is more than. 10, 10 million, 10 billion rupiah, 10 million, yeah? 10 billion, yeah? 10 billion. Now the question of the, what about the carrying capacity? What, if, what about the sensitive area? It's come up to Tangkan, yeah? and other places. So, back to uh, Rhino, Javan Rhino. Yeah? We have a plan to move to other place near Sukabumi, but it is not easy. Because there are also the problem with the uh, local people and uh, the U army use the area for training. 
So is this not easy? Yeah. And uh, Sarawak, they will very soon lost the, the rhino, the rhino. So Sabah, Sabah, yeah. And they asked me to 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 get the semen for the sperm to be stipulated in the uh, in vitro uh, program. Now, this is a lot of effort and it takes a lot of money for that because we lost the habitat. That's our real problem right now. Our problems. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy answer and there is no straightforward recipe for that. It's a struggle. I... I always remember coffee, but uh, apparently you are not, so I need to entertain you. If you don't like coffee, then uh, I think uh, I will sneak out myself out to find coffee and you continue debating. Uh, so I have uh, other three reserve uh, contingency plan to respond to you, other three other speakers. and. I do really hope you have a hot questions. Ask about animals. Harimau jadi jadian. Harimau bunyi. Whatever. It's exciting questions because we are getting... Uh, but don't worry. You, we have time. We will go until 9 p.m. So we go uh, to the front first. Front. Yeah, I see the lady in red. But, and then I go to the back. Another ladies. Ah, are you standing up for raising question? Oh, for coffee? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I'm coming out for the coffee. I think we should allow people at the back to quietly take out, take, go out and take the, coming back with the coffee. And then otherwise, let's stay. Oh, let's stay. No democracy. Okay. No democracy. No coffee for you. So, uh, one, yeah, first question and then the second from the back. Yeah, please. Oh, you, well, all ladies, okay. All ladies, yeah, okay. Okay, two ladies. Get ready, Pak Samidi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amy. I'm from the Nature Conservancy. Um, well, regarding what you've been talking about, how to, about, the, for example, for conserving uh, even the national park or conserving um, animals or rhinos and everything, it needs cost. I'm just curious, is there any of you already applied uh, carbon offset for any tourism activities for offsetting their footprints? To, for example, from Australia to go to Bali or Tangkahan everywhere, just to, um, to cover all the costs that you've been, or the costs you need to preserve the national park or even the animals. I'm just curious. Yeah. If it you is are, not you are yet, referring to ecological footprint, not yes. carbon footprint. Okay. Uh, yeah, for at least for for any conservation uh, activities. Um, if if it is not applied yet, I'm just curious to you, Pak Wiratno, whether you're going to have any policies um, to cover this. Thank you. Thank you. People love policies. But <laughs> they think policies will do some many good things. I thought, uh, I don't like the idea, but... Okay. Neighboring uh, question, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ani Nawir. I'm with C4. Uh, I have a question, maybe to Pak Wiratno or anyone who knows about this uh, policy again. Uh, Pak, ecotourism uh, usually should be part of the Riparda, Pak, the master plan for uh, ecotourism, regional master plan for ecotourism. But I've seen in many uh, area, Riparda has not been uh, developed or is not there yet. I think it's under the coordinations of the tourism uh, ministry, I think, or DINAS. And so how is the coordinations, you know, for developing the integrated Riparda? the master plan for ecotourism that taking into account all of this carrying capacity on also the visibility uh, of this you know natural resources and also the socio-economic impacts uh, and benefits 
And yeah, because uh, in our project site in Sumbawa, Pak, we try uh, make a partnership also with the KPH, the FMU, to uh, develop this ecotourism, uh, community-based ecotourism. So is there any regulations already on that? So probably this is something that uh, also related with the guidelines and everything. So we are in the safe, you know, corridors to develop this uh, in partnerships. And how about it's related with the kemitraan in konservasi, Pak? Apa, is it really, uh, the ecotourism, is it really something that also will be managed under the partnerships for conservations that, uh, yeah, that will be initiated by in the Directorate General under your, uh, yeah, authority. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll just quickly talk to the carbon question. Um, as a business, uh, Intrepid was probably the first company in the world to carbon offset all of our trips for all of our travellers. So we started carbon offsetting in uh, 2010. Um, we inc we inc measure the um, carbon emissions on all of our trips, and then we include it in the pricing. Um, all of our offices are also carbon neutral. Um, with the carbon offset, then we invested in various projects such as um, REDD project in Africa and green energy projects in Turkey and other parts of the world where we travel. So um, I believe that it's a pretty simple solution actually for other companies. It's not a, uh, once you've developed the methodology to do the measurement on the trips and, and you have to get down to quite a lot of detail, it's not actually then a very difficult job to apply it across um, the business for a number of travelers. So it's a way um, that we can um, give back and make sure that we're um, taking responsibility. Uh, well, I think because um, I represent as one of the uh, travel uh, agency, so actually, well, it is not common yet, but actually for us, we already start to um, measure the uh, uh, carbon offset ecologically. So actually, we apply it into our tours. So every tours that we, uh, especially in a, uh, every tour that we go on a car, by car, uh, we plant one tree, uh, and then also if it's if we go on a motorbike, two motorbikes, one tree. Um, I think it is again it is one of the uh, very little step, but then we we do it. We already started, and uh, we started since 2013. Uh, so uh, that's why we also become one of the um, uh, responsible travel uh, for especially from the world Asia. So I think in Indonesia, yeah, we did, we started already. Only in the travel bureau, it is not uh, common yet. But I'm sure in the begin, in the future, it will be more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Francia. Uh, my answer is not directly uh, related to biodiversity offset or, or carbon offset, but uh, probably it relates to uh, crowdfunding. Uh, Kehati has an experience in uh, raising funds from the crowd. Uh, probably it can be applied to uh, ecotourism as well. Examples of Kahati uh, that has been doing in in uh, Sulawesi. Uh, we worked, we made a cooperation with Alpha Mart, and uh, every purchase of in in Alpha Mart, uh, probably we can ask we can ask uh, the chains, the small chains that can be. Uh, for example, uh, contributed to conservation. And this is the good thing is within eight weeks, we can accumulate it 
about 8 billion rupiah for conservation of Dano Tondano in Sulawesi. This is a small thing, but uh, we can get a big, a big uh, revenue from, from the crowd. Uh, this is what we call crowd funding. Probably these simple things can be applied as well in ecotourism uh, activities or industry. Like, for example, from hotels, from uh, tour operators, uh, restaurants, and, and so on. We can, we, we can uh, have a similar, similar uh, scheme. Thank you, Pa. Thank you. Can I intervene? I'm not expert, but trying to be ideal. Before you do any don't, do and don't, and then how much, this should be a basis. There are only two bases in life. One is your common sense, and second is scientific basis. I give you an example of Nasalis larvatus. You know what kind of animal is that? Monyet bekantan. This uh, Dutch monkey, atau orang Belanda, itu is... Uh, sensitive to certain things. So if you uh, organizing a tour operator in a sim at the same time coming into the habitat because observing uh, Bekantan is either very early in the morning or late afternoon before they are going to sleep uh, together with their wives. Yeah, because you know that this is the only monkey with a harem, super polygamist. So that is the time. And because of that, the observers with a uh, uh, speedboat going together to, to catch up with the time and see the area. And these uh, disturbing noises have an impact to the lifestyle of these uh, uh, harem things. So uh, it's an interesting, interesting phenomenon. If you want to see Irrawaddy dolphin in Kalimantan Tengah, you need really to adapt your HP. Uh, powerhouse of the boat because they are very sensitive uh, suara yeah? noises and all this kind of thing so based on that you determine based on that scientific basis you determine how much and it's good news from Robin as far as gorillas concerned in, where? in Africa they said it's 32 is already enough for a day Better they pay for higher cost rather than uh, so many people pay a lower cost, like in Pa Wina Pa Inung's place. You, you, he still like cheap, cheap things, huh? not not expensive one. So it's uh, something that you need to consider. Certain thing you don't know, you need a research or scientific base. The thing that perhaps you know by common sense, you can start regulate and then improve later. That's my intervention about it. The tour operator have a different opinion? You have, you, yeah, okay. Th Thank you, Pa Efranja. I just uh, follow what uh, you have said uh, just now. That's, that's a type of... Uh, carrying capacity that uh, we have to overcome with. Uh, when we don't have scientific judgment or scientific knowledge or whatsoever, uh, that we have to be precautious uh, on that part. So precautionary principles must be uh, observed in, in this regard. So like, for example, uh, in Taman Nasional Gunung Gede Pangrango that uh, on the uh, climber, the, the people, the number of people that may climb in one night is uh, they, they set a number of, uh, berapa Pak Wir, 
600 people. So, uh, this must be observed. Uh, and we have to monitor, to monitor uh, every day what, what are the impacts of, of 500 people. Is there any, any uh, bad impact from 500? If yes, then you have to reduce. And, and on and on uh, like that. That's uh, if, if we, we don't have uh, data, we don't have uh, information, scientific information. Uh, also in Turtle Islands. Uh, Turtle Islands uh, in Malaysia. That's uh, probably we have to queue until two, three years uh, to get to the Turtle Islands. Yes. And that's, uh, that's uh, the thing that uh, uh, concerning the ca carrying capacity. Uh, thank you, Bob. Are you serious? We are going until 9 p.m.? I thought you want to see a bit Malioboro a bit early today, but uh, since uh, my duty is to entertain you, I have to stay. But I already have my coffee. Okay, go ahead. Uh, there are two ladies in red, yeah? Uh, please. Uh, oh, there are more. Some more? Yes. Yo, please, don't, don't, don't do riot. You will have your turn. Yes, go ahead. Hi. I, my name's Gay. I have lived Sorry? and worked. Kenapa? Okay, yeah. My question has not been answered yeah. yet. Mengenai apa tadi? Udah, udah ada. Utang, utang. I owe you, okay? I've lived and worked in Kalimantan, Indonesian Borneo, for 16 years, the last 10 years developing an ecotourism cruise. My question really is about the, the difficulties in separating ecotourism from business, and I think somehow the two terms don't really go together. And I think that... Um, Certainly, if you talk to NGOs about a business, even though it's an ecotourism business, it's still a business. I, I would really like to see somehow NGOs and businesses come together to really promote ecotourism businesses. Um, as a foreigner, we've got a, a PT here, and I have a business partner who's another woman. We actually... and. I'm so interested in pa Wiranto's, Wiratno's comments about how you need to pioneer. We pioneered our business. It was really hard work to develop a tourism industry in Palankaraya on our own. As a foreign, in as a foreign investment company, we got, well, we got a smiling support from a lot of people, but basically it was all our own money, all our own commitment. And now we've got a company which is well established. We operate in three different rivers. Um, I'm sorry, I'm so long. I, 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 I'll come to the point in a minute. Um, the, my question is now, we've established ourselves. We've got a tourism base. We've got a great website. But now when we're wanting to develop other other really, really interesting ideas for um, working with um, orangutan researchers and wanting to develop a really high-end, similar to the gorilla experience perhaps, where we actually need a lot of investment. We're in a bit of a pickle because we're a, we're a, private, we're a private company. We're wanting to develop something which is really going to make a big difference. Where, where do we get the funding from? Yeah. And we're Thank working you. with world-famous orangutan yeah. researchers to develop a really responsible experience. Thank you, Pa Virat. No, I can sense the chemistry, how people love you here. So that, <laughs> can you deal with the two questions? <laughs> yeah, dari Mbak, Ana, siapa Mbak? Siapa ya, Mbak? Siapa namanya? Mbak, 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 Nabi, Mbak. Mani, Mani, yeah. Uh, the problem uh, uh, on uh, integrated planning, yeah. Ribda, yeah, you know, uh, Ribda. 
what we need is uh, the important uh, on all aspects of planning is how you uh, communicate the planning. I believe bottom-up planning is the best. The problem of RIBDA is we treat it as a project. No way. I hate project. Because you forget the, the process, how people buy in your ideas. Yeah. How, how other sector buy in our ideas, like, uh, like me and uh, Ministry of uh, apa? Tourism, for instance. They don't care about the impact of uh, uh, mass tourism. Yeah. They want to high-end tourism. But in my opinion, and to ecotourism and protected areas is totally different. You have to deal with the local people. You have to have an, uh, uh, develop an awareness of the local people. Tangan is only one, one tiny. There are two villages there, and the history, the history of Tangan, I write in my book. And uh, there are many story of Tangan and. Uh, and uh, documentation is very important for us because we just to avoid the same mistake at the same time, many, many mistakes at, uh, at the same place. And uh, it's not easy having a coordination and getting support from other minister. That is why in the, in the ten, 10 commandment, yeah? <laughs> The ten principle of having the new way of working in protected area system and, 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 and the forest management is uh, working with other, other minister. Very easy to say, but difficult. In my experience, we have to have a um, uh, uh, personal contact in the in, in other minister. And then, when we have uh, the same frequency of communication, then they, you know, they can buy in the ideas and we have a mutual respect. And let's do it together, because we cannot do it alone. That is the message. Udah ya? <laughs> Business and ecotourism. I think... In, in the case of Tangkahan, yeah, they manage all their, their business by themselves. I never touch their business. That is my, my <laughs> experience. And I, I just treated as a government at the time, I'm a facilitator. I am your friends. Let's do it. Just sit together. What the local people need is friends. And mostly the, the government, they never, they treated the local people as a, even as the enemy. That's the problem. There are so many, apa itu, mistaken situation. And when we sit together and listening, Pak John, Pak John, yeah. The essence of communication is not speaking like me. The essence of communication is listening. But the problem, there is, there is a new culture for bureaucrat to listen. Bener apa enggak ini? That's our problem in the bureaucracy and the government. It, uh, they are always telling the truth. The government never doing wrong. This is the problem. When we change our way of working with the local community, then start a growing a layer of awareness and respect and love. Finally, I, it's been 17 years, and then the, the, the people in the Tangkan still contact thank me, even now with using WhatsApp. And finally, we are being an extended family. <laughs> Not only in Tangkan, also in everywhere with the local community. Thank you. Thank you, Pak. Now I understand why people love you. <laughs> Can I ask something? Is there anybody from uh, Ecosystem Restoration? No one? Ah. 
Oh, Pak Agus, can I give you a privilege to talk any potential ecotourism in your area, please? Identify yourself first. Okay. He's my friend, but... So, uh, I fully appreciate uh, the, the time that you've given to me. Let me stand up. So, my name is Agus. I'm with Burung Indonesia. Burung Indonesia? Yes, Burung, the bird. Uh, we have a forestry concession in Sumatra. It's about 98,000 hectare. It's in production for it, for us. It's not protected area, but it could be uh, categorized as uh, category six of IUCN protected area. But anyway, uh, direct to the question from Paifran. Yes, uh, ecotourism uh, not just in our forest, which is called Hutan Harapan, but also in num a number of other ecosystem restoration concessions, is uh, sort of becoming one potential source, source of revenue. So maybe for those who are sort of uh, new to ecosystem restoration concession, this is the new type of forestry concession in Indonesia in production forest. So we allow to manage production forest, but not for logging, for conservation and restoration. So we need to generate revenue in order for us to be able to keep operating or running the concession. So we are looking for a number of uh, business opportunities uh, to generate revenue. Among these opportunities, is ecotourism, of course. Um, the experience that we have by Fran uh, in uh, trying to, to establish or develop ecotourism in our concession has been really, really, really hard. Uh, it's not because of the remoteness. Our forest is only three hours by car from the Jambi airport, and three hours you'll be on our camp with a good facility there. Uh, but I think the, the biggest problem is, uh, do we have attractions there? I, we do have wildlife, we do have tigers, but of course, uh, it's not like safari in Africa where you can go there and see the lions and the giraffe walking around you. Uh, it's, it's not easy, uh, and it's quite risky actually to expose that. Because if we do expose that, probably the poachers from the main line, Asia will cross uh, Malacca Strait, going to Sumatra, looking for the, for the elephants and the tigers. They are poachers. So exposing the biodiversity that we have in our area is also a risk. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the poachers, they will also look into the internet, looking for information, even going to the, to the journal, scientific journal, looking for places where they can poach actually tigers, elephants, rhinos. So very, very careful in exposing what pile have you have in your site. And the second experience that it's, it's difficult for us is, is going back to the statement from Robin, actually. One of the things that you emphasized was about itinerary, that travelers looking for good itinerary. You cannot expect uh, people uh, from Europe coming to my forest just to visit the forest and stay there for five days and just having relaxed maybe if, I, if, if, if that is the case, I may need to be uh, uh, establishing spa, for example. It's funny, when, when I talk to a couple of visitors from Singapore, what they would expect if they would stay five days in my forest, well, they said, if I can bring my family together to the forest, but some of us will need massage, spa, stuff like that. Of course, we don't have business, running business and kind of thing. So itinerary is very, very important. But I think uh, uh, we, us here who are working on ecotourism might be very difficult uh, to have good itinerary because uh, Wirato just mentioned about support from the other sort of ministries. Uh, itinerary very much depends on the infrastructure. Yeah. It's a good thing that no Indonesia having so many airports developed, good airports developed, but that's infrastructure might not enough to actually support ecotourism. So, itinerary is very problematic for us, by Fran, to answer your question, uh, because that dip, that's outside of our control, basically. And, and, and uh, what left could be good attraction, but we need to be really, very careful on, on using it to promote the forest, because it might backfire you in terms of, uh, of, of the negative um, um, side of the promotion. Thank you. Thank you, Pak. Thank you, Pak Agus. I fully aware and understand 
the challenge of ecosystem restoration in uh, the context of biodiversity protection, even species protection, because when I was, I served as a CEO of WWF Indonesia for six years, and I know these places require heavy financial subsidies in order to, uh, to figure out later on how to sustain, even to defend and protect the place, you already start with the subsidy and try to develop whatever planning and financial uh, investor or conservation investor later on to come in. I feel a bit tired, but I am surprised and admiring you guys that you still want to, uh, to have uh, uh, these people here as your sparring partners. Can I invite two last questions before encouraging, encouraging everyone to go to Maliaboro late afternoon? Yeah. So, uh, the gentlemen here are very disappointing. Huh? They don't speak up. Another lady, yeah, the lady who just had a coffee after we found an energy. Please, lady in black. <laughs> To the most honorable speakers and all the audience here, my name is Delia Konduti. I'm a Batak that was raised by a widow Batak. And my mom was the first recipient of the peer in 1982, and I was able to be educated with two hectares of palm oil and, uh, and getting out of the orangutan environment. So I'm still half. But anyway, come back to this ecotourism. My opinion is. Uh, since I turned 50, I becoming more patriotic. I went around in Indonesia and looked around. And any type of tourism, I think, is not a contribution to a, a better world. So I think if we do an ecotourism, that the government should implement more regulation that will make a difference to my own people, which is the Indonesian people. If you build an ecotourism somewhere, I've been to Tanjung Puting, and it's such a beautiful place. But then I talk to the people that work there. How many orangutan there is uh, in the conservation? 5,000. How big is the conservation? Half a million hectare. And what is the contribution of the eco lodge there? Nothing. We're just uh, facilitating tourists like me to see the orangutan. So this way, I didn't see the effectiveness, how we are protecting or promoting the orangutan while my Indonesian people or the co-worker there are making three million or less than per month on their salary. So I think the government should put the implement, implement, implementation as hard as the criticism towards uh, hardwood industry or palm oil if you open a tourism in a remote area, you should be dedicated to donate 20% of your income to the people around it so they will be better off, so they can buy goat or maybe chicken and do other stuff. So um, I am a self-finance uh, philanthropist. I bought 2,500 hectares of land in Borneo, which is seven kilometers from Waratewe. And I was invited by Ibu Siti Nurbaya three days ago because I didn't know nothing about the forest conference. And she asked me to put my boots outside, which is called Love NO2. This is just for people to know like, oh, what type of tree that is available in our rainforest. We don't have orangutan, we don't have anything. I only have like, if we could bring the more than happy. So um, I'm, I'm very open <laughs> to help out or to speak, but I, my heart is so outbroken and I actually look up uh, Agus from uh, from the Burung. Burung and I met him yesterday and he told me Delia um, what you did is actually very noble but uh, I don't need the nobility I hope that I could make a difference and, okay. uh, and uh, you know especially I'm so interested on this ecotourism that um, that the government should look up more to the people, the poor people. The poor people cannot survive with the UMR. You yep. have to change the livelihood. So if you go out there, okay. you should commit a little bit of your percentage, yeah, yeah. like the plasma or something, so the people will be... Thank you better. very much, Delia. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if I can give keywords to your intervention, 
you want us to discuss about benefit distributions involving local communities and uh, wider impact of ecotourism in terms of well-being. I think that's the way I put your questions and thank you for the case that you put forward because it's concrete and real. And uh, I go to the neighboring. Yeah, the gentleman should be honored by applause because ini bukan pria loyo seperti yang lainnya. Hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Dixon John. I'm uh, with uh, Sarawak Planted Forest uh, from Malaysia, truly Asia. Um, okay, my, actually my question is uh, directed to Dr. Samidi. Uh, just now you talk about uh, the possibility of the community to be changed when uh, a lot of these visitors coming into the areas uh, visiting for ecotourism and whatnot. <clears throat> I may not have uh, 150 uncles back in the village, but probably 161 of the aunties will have a different reaction to how to how, how they would uh, you know receive these visitors. Because uh, when when you think about it, Asian cultures are very friendly, and all all of them, whether you are Thailands, Thais, or Malaysians, Indonesians. They are very receptive of visitors coming into their culture. But when you have two different cultures being in contact, they are bound to be uh, changes. One will influence the other. And uh, Dr. Uh, Samidi, based on your experience, how has uh, the local communities that you have encountered uh, react to this kind of uh, context? And also leading to my uh, second question is that... Um, How do you do we go about and address uh, social readiness? Because we all know that each one of these uh, communities are very different in their own right, and each one have their own needs and you know to to, uh, to address and to make to 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 okay. bring themselves into that. So we got two questions. Are you ready to deal with the first one from my sister, Elia? Elia. Well, no, I was just thinking, listening to everyone today, and I didn't represent that in my, my thinking has changed a little bit in this conversation. I thought it was really good. So thank you to everyone that had their uh, interventions. Ecotourism, eco there's this conception, particularly in the West, that it's good. It's always good. It's good people, nice, you know, they care about wildlife, they care about communities, that, but maybe not always. And I think you need strong government, and I think the government has to to decide if we looked at all those assets I looked at, maybe some of them you shouldn't develop for ecotourism. I think his point was very, very good. Uh, he must have left. But, you know, ecotourism isn't always good. It can be good, but it has to be carefully done. It has to be in co consultation with the community. It has to benefit the community. But it's not a panacea and it's not going to be perfect. I mean, you can make some huge mistakes. And if you just let businesses go out all over the place and say they're ecotourism, I think they're going to mess up a lot of stuff. But I don't know. I, I put that back to you. Is ecotourism always good? Yeah. Uh, somebody? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pa Dixon from uh, Malaysia. Uh, I just would like to uh, show that uh, or to uh, present that ecotourism or tourism could affect the social uh, social value social behavior or uh, whatever in, in, in the, at, at the local level uh, small change or I have experience in in Lampung in Taman National Waikambas in this Waikambas National Park uh, we have local NGOs there that's uh, working with uh, local people. Uh, the local people used to be very friendly, very, but when uh, we develop uh, tourism industry, uh, the people start to change their behavior like uh, they already commercialize everything. So everything will be counted as money. That's, that's uh, one small change that we identified as 
as uh, if we we just uh, follow that that way, then probably uh, the change will be getting bigger and bigger. That's uh, what we we have to uh, to be aware about that and and uh, don't go further over uh, bad change in behavior. That's uh, what what actually uh, our point in in uh, our presentation. That uh, yeah, social readiness. That uh, that's what what uh, I would like to uh, present in in our uh, our talk. That uh, visitors can bring everything. Uh, like our experience in Aceh, for example, that uh, the local community uh, don't want receive any uh, foreign visitors. Uh, this is our experience in uh, Rawasinkil, Trumon, it's uh, just a bit north of the Rawasinkil uh, game reserve. Uh, in in Aceh, that uh, they only want they only wanted uh, visitors, uh, local visitors. Uh, they still think that that uh, foreign visitors uh, are probably in in our in their mind uh, bad things uh, to the local. So this kind of of uh, thinking of of behavior probably need to be uh, yeah the the, the uh, our our uh, uh, thing that uh, our thinking is that uh, we we provide the people with everything that they need uh, in in uh, socially or or scientifically and 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 thing like that. So that's uh, uh, our experience in working for several years in, in Sumatra. Thank you. I intend to wrap up soon and adjourn. But you look at me horrifyingly that uh, you disagree. So, okay. As an intermezzo, I recognize two old friends of mine who came all along all the way from Japan from the International Tropical Timber Organization. I just saw Dr. Ma and then Dr. Stephen Johnson. I wonder if they want to make any intervention on ecotourism. Steve, are you still there? You are no longer there. Dr. Ma? No one. Anybody else from ecosystem restoration? No one. So then we go again to public. One last question, one million dollar. Okay, please. You got the second one, yes. We were talking about certifying, ah. right, certification. I, we've actually, our business won an award as a responsible operator. Do you think it might be good if ecotourism operators actually also were certified in this way? Yeah. Is there any burning question from here? No? This will be the last question because... Uh... Ah, Pak Agus, shortly, please promise me because otherwise I will charge you more. Come on. Best practice guidelines on sustainable tourism in protected areas. Maybe, maybe that will be good for those practicing because this best practice guideline actually developed uh, by practitioners. So the title is Best Practice Guidelines on Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas. You just Google it and I'm sure you will have the PDF file. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think we need that, yeah. To, let, let's do it with, with, with me. Yeah. No more discussion. Let's do it in Tangkan, do it in Sembalun, 
and do it in uh, other places for certification. Yeah, it is very important part of the the our effort to uh, the one hand is serving uh, serving the protecting the forest, but also the other in the other case that uh, educate local. There are many local guides there. Yeah. Even in in Bromo, there are many apa itu illegal intruder ya, yeah. encroachers brought by the local guide. This is very bad ya. Yeah. In Rinjani everywhere and just now in uh, mana Merbabu, one uh, hiker dies because uh, he died because uh, the uh, they have the he had he try a new tracking without any notice to us. So this, this is a bad practice. So so standardization uh, guiding is very important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, just want to talk to the question about certification. I think um, there are many already out there certifications that you can apply for as businesses, but I think the important thing is that in many cases there's not a lot of rigor around the certification. So I think uh, it's important that if we're going to develop a best practice certification that's globally recognized, um, that it needs to have some scientific measure and some um, real evaluation metrics to support it. I am forced to invite my two, to keep balance here, my two other speakers to say few last words. Um, okay, thank you, Pak Francia. So, uh, for me as a practitioner and also represents for the associations of travel agency in Indonesia here, um, however, ecotourism is one of the way to uh, protect the uh, uh, environment and also protect the area itself, but then it's also uh, the uh, involvement of the local people again and again, it is very important. So, uh, mainly, we, what we would like to, to say and emphasize, don't forget local people. Okay. Um, the ecotourism uh, is news of the biodiversity, as I, I said before. And then the high potential before, uh, biodiversity is still remain in the protected area. Of course, we should take care to uh, conserve about the uh, bio biodiversity remaining. Because if all biodiversity in Indonesia is lost, we cannot have anything. Thank you, Pat. Burning question or burning statement? Uh, follow on certification. Uh, that's uh, what uh, we, we propose uh, in uh, my presentation. That Certification, if it is agreed and will be applied, that must be, must be tailored or must be designed in such a way. So very small enterprises can also be facilitated. Thank you. I will not conclude. We had a rich exchange of views. Surprisingly, the floor responds very well uh, with the varied uh, different background. And we talk about conceptual thinking. We talk since, uh, in particular, uh, ecotourism is a juvenile uh, ideas introduced in the country. And there are some limited les lesson learned. And we heard some concrete suggestion towards do and don't. And then we got a sign of some disadvantages and then potential way to go forward, including certification and a better distribution of benefit. And we heard a lot of challenges from your rich experience. I take the liberty being your moderator, to adjourn 15 minutes earlier in respect of the demise 
of rowing a male rhino among the 54 remaining single horn rhino of Ujung Kulon passed away dead uh, yesterday and necropsy is ongoing. I am arranging, we are arranging a press releases while entertaining you here. And uh, you know, when it comes to one single horn rhino, because the last one already gone in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken, the, so the, the one in Ujung Kulon is the last frontier for one single horn rhino, uh, rhino sondaikus, yeah? Uh, rhino sondaikus. So uh, please bear this sad news with me. So with your permission, we adjourn the meeting earlier than 5 p.m. As your moderator, if you are not happy with me, let me know immediately. Please don't viral me in the social media. <laughs> uh, and, but if you are happy with me, please viral it outside that uh, people will can hire me next time anywhere else. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. That's actually is the, the imitation of Padang, Padang restaurant. Thank you very much, friends. It is a really discussion among the family. I salute all my panelists here for being very rich and disciplined. Thank you very much. Sorry for uh, unjustice eight minutes, although some of you use ten minutes. I hope to see you again and please do not miss Malioboro only after the closing session. Thank you very much. See you again. Thank you.